Big episode of the Shane Anything podcast coming up. Andy and Keith are both joining me as we preview the season. It is opening week in Major League Baseball. Lots to discuss. Does chicken parm dinner in Florida actually change the possibility that Francisco Lindor at this moment will be a Met long term? We'll discuss that with Andy and also get Keith's take on everything he saw in spring training and looking ahead to the season. Shane Anything podcast starts now. Welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, a couple quick announcements before we get started. Obviously, Thursday is opening day. Um, the game is on a, another network that shall not be named. However, live coverage on SNY starts at 5.30 with Baseball Night New York, and then a 60-minute city pregame live, Gary Apple, Todd Zeal, Anthony Recker. Um, and don't forget, W. Mason, postgame live after the game. SNY's first game is on Saturday, April 3rd. That's an hour-long city pregame live at 3, ahead of first pitch at 405. Um, welcome to you both, Keith, Andy. Happy to have you both on a little season preview show. Keith, before we get to you, um, Steve Cohen basically broke the news himself, I guess, that they had dinner. No, it was it was broken by, I guess, Jeff Passan of ESPN, Andy, correct? That, that he had I'm not dinner. sure who had it first. I just know they ate. I just am so used to Steve Cohen tweeting yeah. things out before the rest of us find out. But so... Steve Cohen and Lindor have dinner in Florida. Are we supposed to mean that that means anything other than they had dinner in Florida? Do you think the chances have increased since you heard that news? Yeah. Yes. Um, especially because one or both of those sides is willing to get that leaked out there. Um, apparently it was reported before. I, I don't remember the exact sequence over the weekend, but the fact that we know about it, like it doesn't mean there's a guarantee of anything happening, but at, at this point, as you well know, Doug, what I've been reporting and hearing from the Mets all spring is that we might sign them, we might sign someone else. And they really mean that. But uh, they haven't had dinner with someone else. Right. <laughs> so, and they haven't seen the point that you made on Twitter was they he's wearing their uniform. They're having dinner with him. He's got a leg up on yeah, a free it, agent it, to be in months. At this point, you know, uh, uh, Cohen just hasn't had chicken parm with Corey Seager, nor could he legally. <laughs> it would be tampering. So, yeah, I think Lindor is the guy. So, Keith, um, if you imagine yourself as a player on the precipice of a big extension, do you think chicken parm at Tuto Fresco with the owner of that team would increase your chances and the likelihood of you staying with that team? Does that, um, you know, bring any thoughts to mind? Well, that's kind of an obvious answer. My, my question would be, how does Michael Conforto take this? He, he's got to go to dinner with the boss too, doesn't he? I don't know if he's getting that invite, Keith. I'd like to see him re-signed as well. It's a great yes. point. So, Andy, you've been saying now for a few days or weeks, I don't know how time doesn't exist anymore, but um, that Conforto's not really – those conversations aren't active. Lindor nope. is more active. Correct. Um, so the Mets made Conforto an offer. I don't have the numbers for you, but I can tell you that on instinct, knowing the parties involved, it wasn't anywhere close to what Conforto and Scott Boris are looking for. They're looking at Conforto as like a $200 million some player or almost. And uh, Keith, I know, like I've been listening to you for years now talk about Conforto's improvements as a hitter and how he's become a, a guy that now is, so much less tempted by the home run and the uh, desire to pull the ball and using all fields and evolving and all this stuff. And you're help, you've helped that come to life. It's for lay people like me seeing why he's a guy to invest in. But, you know, I've talked to Boris about this over the past couple of months and he's like, Springer is just a starting point. Springer is 150 because Springer is a couple of years older than Conforto and sure. they want to use uh, that as a baseline and then add a premium for Conforto's prime years. So now I'm not saying that's unfair, but when that adds up, you, you got Alderson and Cohen looking at 300 million ish for Lindor, another 180 to two for Conforto, even for a really rich guy. It's a, that's it's a, a lot. Half a billion dollars. Which is more than I have. I don't know about any, either of you, but it sounds like a lot to me. But it's spread out over the years and it'll be able to defer money and um, all that. Um, We'll see. It's very interesting with our new ownership, isn't it? Uh, things have uh, 
they've made a lot of great moves. I think that Lindor, the way he's played, okay, he's got a body of work. He's a two-time All-Star. He's a gold glover. Um, he flashed the leather, and he's been hitting. I don't care if he wasn't hitting in spring training, but the fact that he's been wearing it out. Mm. And not only that, how he's so involved in the game that is just stunning to me. I haven't seen that I think has added more of a premium to him. And they're going like, my God. Um, I remember Frank Cashin telling me when they made the trade for Frank Robinson for Milk Pappas, I know mm -hmm. I'm being contemporary. Don't tell Kurt. Um, uh, Frank said, we knew we were getting a great player in Frank Robinson. He goes, but what you don't know is the personality of the player. And when uh, Robinson, Frank came over to the Orioles, he'd made them into a really gritty, tough team that went on to dominate. And Frank said, we, how, how do you, there's no barometer for that. So I feel what Lindor is showing uh, in spring training, his enthusiasm and the fact, the fact that he's into the game and this is spring training. And uh, to me, I'll take a chance on that. That is, yeah. has gotten my attention and he's got to be in the orange and blue for more than a few years. Hearing what you're saying about Lindor, not just being the great player, but the, the having the presence, having the leadership, the personality. I know, I think we all feel that Conforto also has his own kind of presence. But when I am then sharing with you the reporting about his price and how it's like, oh, wow, it's not nice little homegrown Michael Conforto. It's superstar price. Uh, does that give you any pause at all in thinking like, do you think, well, Conforto is really good, but is he that guy? Is he the guy making that much more than um, David Wright ever made with the Mets? I understand it was a few years ago, but you know, like, are you, do you put Conforto in that tier of stars to get that kind of money? It's all about your timing is everything. Uh, when you're having your option year, that's when you got to max out. Now, he had a, gr a very good year last year, um, and it was only 60 games or whatever the heck it was, 60? Or yeah. 60? yeah. So it wasn't a full season. But it's quite apparent that Michael is uh, an upper echelon player. Um, he is sometimes he's Mr. Nice Guy, and sometimes organizations can take advantage of that and think that he's a, you know, but – he's got the toughest agent, negotiating agent in the game and Scott Boris. So that negates that, you know, Michael can, I don't think Michael's the kind of guy that's going to say, Hey, I want to be the highest paid player in the game or the highest paid outfielder in the game. Uh, but I certainly feel that Springer's 150. I think Boris is right on by saying, Hey, it's gotta be more than that. He's younger, yeah. you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And as Doug and I have talked about, both he and Lindor are prominent in the union, which I think is another factor why he's not necessarily going to be Mr. Nice Guy. You're, you're not just looking for your own contract. You're looking out for players who are comps to you, right? You, you want to say, I can't take a discount if I care about the overall brethren. It's one of the unfortunate things in the game today. Come here, Hardy. Uh, he just wants to go outside. Um, is that the money is so, it's just so off the charts. And, you know, Steve Cohen's come here and wants a winner. And you've got two players that are going to be your foundation. And if he wants to win and he set the benchmark, Mr. Cohen, at four to five years, and then you'll have a reset if it doesn't happen. Um, these two characters of uh, characters, two players are your foundation going forward and you're getting them in their, in their prime years. Mm -hmm. So there's decisions to be made. If you want to win, I, you want to win, you'll make it back in the gate. But you got, we got to get through the COVID and get past this 20% and start getting full capacity. It, it's interesting. You know, Haji gets one write up in GQ and just thinks he can hijack the, the podcast. And he's just been. He wants out. He's not going to stop meowing. So it's going to be disruptive to the interview. Haji's this just going to be part of it. We had to add, we have to add Haji's headshot to the, uh, to the threesome that we have in the program. Yeah, that's true. He's, um, you can read about Haji in GQ, by the way. I was not <laughs> kidding. Um, there's a few mentions of Keith, but it's mostly about uh, Haji the cat. Yes, it is. Um, so I, I've been thinking about this Lindor, 300 million and 
as Keith made the point, Lindor plus Conforto is half a billion dollars. That's, that's a lot of money. Um, it is an adjustment for me mentally to think, does it really matter? Steve Cohen is that rich to the point where like, if the uh, Mets under Will Potton ownership had decided, okay, Lindor's our guy. Let's, let's, this is our superstar. This is our Mookie Betts, Fernando Tatis. Let's sign him. Then you might be changing your payroll capabilities for years to come. Uh, we like this player, but we've got Lindor under payroll. So we're not going to go there. Andy did. Does it matter? Like I know drunken sailors, the Mets didn't spend like drunken sailors this past off season and good on them for that. But if they do sign Lindor to a $300 million contract, is it really going to change anything about the way they do business in four or five years? Yes. Big time. And I'll tell you why it's not about Steve Cohen's money, which he has enough of. Uh, it's about Sandy Alderson. And I assume Cohen, cause they're mostly on the same page. It's at this point uh, it's about flexibility. Sandy's big thing is flexibility. He doesn't, he, he, and the way he looks at rosters is he can't possibly anticipate the needs of his roster in three years. So the last thing he wants is to be locked into these big contracts. Like he never would have taken on the Cano contract under any circumstances. And in a perfect world, I'm sure that if he were the owner of the team, he wouldn't be giving anyone a 10 year deal uh, because he wants to be able to pivot to something in three or four years without a high percentage of a payroll being locked up in one or two guys. Now that's not the reality of the game. That's not the reality on the ground with, as Keith spoke to, look, you've got two players in their primes, like, and it's time to make a decision on them. So it's not perfect world that a Sandy Alderson might draw up, but to your question, Doug, it's not about, a percentage of Steve Cohen's billions. It's about roster flexibility. You've got 26 spots at the moment. It's been 25 forever. Let's say 26 spots. And you, uh, an Alderson, uh, Alderson's philosophy doesn't want to allot too many of those years or dollars to one position. That's what it is. I just think of that Andrew Friedman quote. Um, I think it was, he told Andy McCullough this, uh, the athletic back in the day was like, if you are rational about every free agent, you'll finish third on every free oh, agent. I think Sandy Alderson wants to finish third on every free agent. He doesn't think it's a way to, to do business, which, by the way, is part of why they traded for Lindor. It's a little bit more rational to negotiate with him in spring training than to negotiate with him in December against other teams. But you're describing the importance or lack thereof of Steve Cohen's money, and yet – you've also reported that the Mets are willing to give Lindor 300 million. So if Sandy doesn't want to do that, it seems that Steve Cohen's money is the more important factor. Yeah. Well, look, um, I, I bet you Sandy wouldn't have done the David Wright extension either if it was up to him in 2012, but mm -hmm. sometimes ownership gets involved. Well, oftentimes ownership gets involved when it comes to the big doings. Always look at the stadium and see how many, uniforms or which player has the most uniforms when you got 45,000 people in the ballpark. And it was always number five, David Wright. And uh, now it looks like it's a too early to tell. It's going to be a lot of Lindor. Um, that's where I think management looks to that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's bread and butter. Um, let's, let's, yeah, I, I'm with you. Um, let's move forward to some, not necessarily predictions, but just thoughts on the season ahead. Um, Keith, other than, you know, potentially a, a shorter commute, as I know you've got some uh, plans to not do that drive every day for every home game. Uh, mm -hmm. What excites you the most about the Mets on the field going into this year? I think they got a, and they've displayed it in spring. Now, going forward, spring doesn't count, but they've got a pretty dynamic lineup. And it's not so much the power. Everybody's all enamored with the power. They've got speed at the top. And I feel that there's no reason why um, I like Lindor in the two-hole. Um, Nemo, of course, is going to lead off. I'd like to see Nemo, Nemo steal more, but I don't know if that's in the game today. But I think the one, two, the punch, it's like uh, it sets the tone. You've got two, one guy that gets on base. It's a good hitter and can run and hustles and sets the tone with kind of a Pete Rose type of, uh, but not the, not the toughness of Pete Rose because Brandon's such a smiley, easygoing guy. I mean, Pete was just a tenacious animal. But then you got Lindor behind him. It's very much like when we had Mookie and, and uh, Backman 
or Lenny and Backman one, two, it, it set the tone for us going forward. And then the big guns behind, it's very similar. I like the balance in the lineup, the power, uh, the speed. Uh, I think they're going to score runs and I just think they're ready to click. I really do. Keith, do you have a studio set up for games this year at home? They're going to set up uh, this week just as a backup in case someone gets the pandemic and can't go to the ballpark or someone. And I guarantee if, if um, Ronnie or one of us get it in the booth, I mean, then Ronnie has to get checked or I have to get checked because we're in the same area. So it's just a backup in case. Um, uh, and it's right on my desk over here behind me over my, my right shoulder. Well, not to stir it up. I had it last year and I never used it. We never had to use it. You had it last year? Um, You know, I cover both New York teams and, you know, not not for nothing, but Paul O'Neill hasn't left Ohio uh, since this thing began. So I think you love push a little harder. I would love not to have an 86 mile drive. From well, I'm just, I'm not trying to say yeah, what, 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 <laughs> what I was referring to Keith is that you'll be, you're staying in the city a little bit more. You're learning from learning from last year, last year's long pothole filled commute. Well, 60 games. I did 52 games last year. And I remember I had my back is hundred percent with the surgery I had two years ago. It's a miracle, but you know, three hours in a car, you know, for those 52 games was a little rough. And now I'm going to do 100, uh, 110. We're not going on the road again. So 110 trips back and forth. And, you know, what am I going to do when it's a West Coast game, a night game? Night game is not going to be over till 1.30, 1.45 in the morning. Yeah. So like a nice deal in the hotel on the, on the uh, east side. And um, uh, I'll take advantage of that, break up the monotony of the trip. Um, all right, Andy, same thing for you. Um, you picture yourself sitting down watching Mets games this year. What, what are you most excited to watch from the team? I just want to see how it all gels. I've got, I, Keith gave such a nice specific answer and I could get into different areas uh, of the team. But for me, honestly, I'm at the point of the year where I've been watching the Yankees and the Mets in spring training and peripherally paying attention to the Dodgers and the Padres and all these other kind of interesting threads going on. And there's something about just like ring the bell and let's see how it actually looks. And I just want to see, you've got a new team. You've had so much roster turnover. You've got a new star, obviously in Lindor, new owner, the return of Alderson. There's so many elements. Uh, And I just want to see, how does this team feel? How does it look out of the gate? You have that special championship feel. Is it, do they stumble? And for some reason, the hole isn't the sum of the parts or like, what is it? With both teams that I've been covering closely in spring training every day, I am just starved to, like, see how they look when the bright lights are on. And, I, again, I apologize for that being a generic answer, but that's how I get this last week. I just want to see what competition brings out of these clubs now. I'm ready to see the real thing. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm i most curious and most excited, I guess, is the wording of the question. But Dom and Pete um, – and I know, Keith, that this is something that you've, you know, focused on, studied, obviously, of being at first base, but also Don being the better defender at first base, however, being the everyday left fielder. How does he look out there? Is there a chance that halfway through the year, he looks like a decent left fielder and plays out there every day? Is there a chance that Pete Alonso has a slow start after he got too hot in spring training, cools down, and then there's a little bit of pressure on Luis Rojas? to maybe play the better defensive first baseman at first every day. And then Pete gets relegated to a different role. That's the thing that I'm excited to watch. And I, because I think that those two players have potential to be your three and four hitters every day and they play the same position. I think that's intriguing Keith. And I think that there is some pressure on Pete Alonso to perform, to start the year because Dom's sitting there with the better glove. Well, that's why they play the games. I mean, they put this team together. And now the players have to go out there and play up to their potential and perform. And if they play up to their potential, this is going to be a team that's going to win. It's going to win a lot of games. Um, that's interesting. I always like to throw in uh, Conforto in the mix because I like that left, right, left. So I like uh, uh, Alonzo in the cleanup hole. I never liked putting your best hitter in the two hole. I never bought into that nonsense. And now it seems like we're getting back to traditional third hitter 
Uh, I mean, McNeil could hit third, but McNeil yeah. doesn't like to take pitches. McNeil would give you another speedy guy, one, two, three, at the top of the lineup, and a guy that is really a third hitter, but he doesn't take a lot of pitches. Uh, I don't like McNeil down in the six hole. Um, I could put Dom behind uh, Alonzo um, in the five hole. That's an RBI spot. And the six hole is an RBI spot too. So, you know, what, it, it, there's some questions there. And then you're going to have two left handers. I know that Alderson likes that left, right, left, right. But, um, you know, Dom in the three hole, I just think Dom's more of a power hitter. I kind of like him more in the five hole, but then that's going to upset your balance and you're going to have Conforto and Dom back to back. So that kind of creates a problem, but what's wrong with that? Hey, Keith, right. with me, are you seeing anything with McNeil this spring that bothers you other than just a guy being uh, in spring getting his work in? When he first came up, he's uppercutting more. You can see that big uppercut. Yeah, like, yeah. He never had that. He had a little bit of it. You gotta, you gotta swing like a golf swing on a ball below the waist, you know, and, and it gets more extreme as the ball gets lower in the strike zone. But he stayed more on top on the ball from the waist up, and he's not doing that right now. And you know, he fights himself too. He doesn't like to make outs, and he doesn't know how to hide it. You know, he's got to learn to yeah. not show his anger and be professional. And it's, it's all part of, I think, maturity. And he, and it's also though what makes him what he is because he doesn't like to make outs and you want guys like that. So um, I'm not worried about him. He might break out in April red hot. We know he can hit. So Yeah, but if he starts swinging like Cody Bellinger, then all of a sudden, who is he, right? I mean, if he does that too much. Well, you know, because that's not I McNeil's mean, game. Went off the charts. And that, you know, I, I really think Chili Davis is a, is a positive in that, in that dugout as a hitting coach. And I think he's got Conforto to go the other way. I think when they had K-Long, uh, K-Long here, it was the Yankee way, drop the back shoulder and look for something to pull and hit out of the ballpark. Conforto's admitted to the bad habit. He has to work on it. Those are bad habits. And uh, sometimes I think hitting coaches do more damage than good. But, uh, uh Chili Davis is more of the old fashioned hitter. I played against Chili and he used, he was a gap to gap hitter and he's stressing getting back to that. And I think McNeil needs to go there and really look at maybe trying to level off his swing a little more. I, I, I think about, I know Lindor is a good two hitter and he's got speed, but if McNeil's back to being that 330 hitter, he'll be batting one or two. Um, and I think. He doesn't take. I don't think. I don't think they're gonna keep a three thirty hitter if he six hits in the order. He's my, he's, if he hits three thirty, he's my number three hitter. I, I mean that he's too. That would work. Big boppers oh. down the lineup. Yeah. You guys know as well as I do that an Alderson team is not thinking about batting average for that. They're thinking about on base too. So to Keith's point, he doesn't take enough for a Sandy Alderson to team to put him in the one or two hole, unless his batting average is off the charts. Especially with maybe. Lane. You know, with Lindor being the switch hitter. And um, it's interesting problems. Uh, and I don't really call them problems. In- interesting options. There's a lot of uh, talent on this offensive unit. Yep. Yeah, I'm just the 30-year-old, uh, old-school simpleton thinking in batting average terms. Um, somehow. With the times. It's important. It adds yeah. to, you know, you, um, McNeil doesn't walk that much. But if he's hitting 330, and he can, he's proven to be a clutch hitter too. So your three hitter has to be someone that can drive in runs as well. So um, that then that creates a problem with a balance in your lineup. Are you going to hit? Uh, you'd hit. You'd, so you'd have the two left handers. But who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Um, all right, three batter rule. These are kind of just three questions to go into the year with. Um, I think Mets fans are nervous about the bullpen and the way Jeff worded it on a rundown here is the bullpen bad. (laughs) Um, I happen to think it's fairly deep. Um, I'm not really sure what Robert Gesellman has done to earn a spot on the team, uh, but he has apparently made the team. Um, And I also thought it was interesting that Jacob Barnes opened for Joey Lucchese on Friday. And I think that shows something that they'll do this year. Andy, do you think the Mets bullpen is, as Jeff so eloquently puts it, bad? 
Uh, no, I think that uh, you, they're going to miss Lugo, obviously, for a while. Uh, and they hope he's himself when he comes back. If you're looking at Lugo, May, Diaz, seven, eight, nine, you'd feel pretty good about that uh, if, if that all comes together. So, I mean, is there a bit of a soft underbelly in the bullpen? Sure. But I think Trevor May was a huge signing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they have enough starting pitching depth where some of those guys can spend some time in the bullpen if they have to. Uh, I, I don't know that the bullpen's an extreme strength, but uh, I, I, I really like the addition of May. And once Lugo comes back, I think they're pretty deep in terms of their uh, high end guys. Keith, I know we've talked about some of the wild cards in that bullpen, Miguel Castro being one of them. And mm -hmm. you've kind of described watching him as, you know, he can lose the plate. He's obviously got a great arm, but spring training, he was electric for a pitcher like that who can throw a hundred occasionally lose the plate. If he puts together a body of work like that in spring training, do you buy in or do you think with somebody like that, any given night he could blow up? Oh, I buy in. Uh, he's got a good stuff and uh, he's got guts too. I've seen him pitch. He can get a little wild, but a lot of times he's a young guy. He's been the Baltimore or Oriole organization his whole his career and their last place team, a loser. And you kind of get in the doldrums and now you come over to a new organization that's set to win and you get inspired and you, your focus is there a lot more. He is going to get every opportunity. He's, he's a, I think he's a mainstay, a very important piece in that bullpen. And I don't think this bullpen's bad at all. I really don't. Um, Familia, Okay. Uh, Batanz is making the team, guys? Yeah. he's a veg They weighed releasing him, but he's going to be on. All right. So the two guys that are, for me, are question marks are the two veterans, Familia and Batanz. Um, has Batanz just been overworked by the Yankees and the injuries? It's tough to come back from the Achilles. Uh, Familia is always going to go out there and pitch, but he can lose the plate. Uh, but I love May. Uh, he is, to me, a real gritty, I'm coming after you, right-hander, and I like him a lot. I've liked what I've seen from Castro, and I really think Diaz is over the hump. I think last year with no fans, uh, remember, he had got off to a sluggish start in April, and I was going up there in the booth going, oh, boy, here we go. So he didn't have to hear it from 45,000 New Yorkers and he was able to relax and get into the season. And he had a really good, uh, I mean, I, and I'm not talking about results. I can see on TV, his stuff got back and he started throwing the slider for a strike and got more on top. And I've seen it in spring training. So I really think he's the key and he's going to, if, if he can get back and I feel he can this year, get back to the closer he was in Seattle, then look out, look out. Yeah. Andy Barnes is Jacob Barnes is making the team too, right? I believe so. Yeah. I, I thought it was interesting. Jeremy Hefner was asked during one of the in-game interviews. I think Steve Gubbs was in Port St. Lucie and asked him um, like, who's one guy that's really impressed you. And Hefner said, Jacob Barnes and Hefner also Keith, to your point on Diaz. I know that's been the number one thing that they've worked on being on top. And right. I think he's done a really good job. And obviously this is the year that we're going to find out if Hefner's got some long-term, um, you know, if the ability to stay here long-term as the Mets pitching coach, because there's a new regime watching. Um, Keith, second of the three batter rule from Jeff here. Um, can the Mets beat the Braves? Sure. It's going to be a, it's going to be a dog fight. It, it's uh, don't count out the nationals too. The nationals are, could be a sleeper if they keep those pitch, that pitching staff rotation healthy. Um, but Clearly, uh, the Braves are the defending champs. But, you know, they've got some question marks in their rotation, in the back end of their rotation. they got guys there that haven't had much experience, and they just can't say, okay, because they had a season last year, a 60-game season, that this is what they're going to get from them this year on a full year. they got question marks in that rotation. But, you know, they've, they've got a good lineup, and they play hard. They're going to be tough. It's, I think it's going to be kind of a – a season, I really feel it's going to be like the 80s with us competing with the Cardinals for those three, four years in the, in the, in the mid-80s. Hmm. You know, I think, I think the Mets 
certainly could beat the Braves. Um, and one of the things that people aren't talking about, Keith mentions the rotation. And also, Braves back into their bullpen's a little thinner than maybe we're thinking about. Um, the, Mark Melanson's not there anymore. And he, he held down the back end there for, for a couple of years. And uh, Shane Green's not there anymore, who had some yep. success for them. Right. O'Day was on the Braves last year, wasn't he? Who? Yes. I Darren they, O'Day. Yeah. They've yeah, got, so. Yep. O'Day's on the Yankees now. Uh, I mean, look, they're, they're missing some relievers. The Braves, at the beginning of this little run they've been on, it was like their bullpen was really bad. Then they got guys like O'Day, Melanson, um, Green, brought the – uh, uh, short Chris up Martin. Board. Yeah, and now a lot of those guys are gone. So that's the thing. That's a concern about the Braves. So the Braves have a lineup too, and uh, mm -hmm. I think Darno is. I, I really what I saw of Darno is what I saw of Darno when he came up before he started overswinging and trying to pull. Everybody wants the home run, and he got in a bad habit, just a, a right-handed version of Conforto. And now he's hitting line drives to the opposite field, and he's another hustling player. Um, they had to sign the big guy, the outfielder Ozuna, and that was key because they're a left-handed lineup, and uh, they're going to be tough. It's going to be a, it's going to be fun. I, what, what else can we wish for? You know? Yeah. Yep. I, I just think about Acuna, Freeman, and Ozuna, and that's just so scary um, for any pitcher. Um, Acuna might win the the MVP. Freeman could win the MVP. Um, don't, don't keep out Albies too. Albies is yeah, pretty yeah. Cool. <laughs> Albies is a really good player. Really good player. Um, okay, so Jeff wants one prediction out of both of you. Um, this can be whatever you want. It can be, um, you know, on field. Uh, it can be a big picture. It can be, you know, in the minutia. Um, Andy, is there one thing that you feel confident will happen with the Mets this year? Well, I know that the Mets, like the rest of us, all one day will perish and leave this earth. I'm confident that's that that's how it will end. But in terms of this year, I will say I think the Mets are going to win the division. Um, I really do. We just talked about the Braves. I agree with Keith. The Nationals, a little sneaky. Brad Hand will help shore up uh, some areas where Doolittle, say, wasn't exactly the guy for them. Um, but uh, I just – I think the Met, I, I'm I'm willing to call the Mets as my preseason and Ellie's pick. I agree with you, Keith. Um, I think the Mets have uh, as good a chance as the Braves to win. You never know how the season falls. Uh, injuries are are critical. You can't predict. This is a very very competitive division. Uh, I underestimated Miami. I've seen Miami in spring training and looked at their roster. If their pitching holds up their young pitchers, they're going to be a tough team. I mean, they're not going to be there, I don't think. But you're, it's a team that you're going to have to play in division, what, 19 times? And you're going to have to go out there and beat them and play. They're going to come to play. And then you've got the Braves, of course, and then you've got the Nationals. I've never been a fan of the Phillies. I just think the Phillies are... Uh, Something's missing. I, I just... That's the one team I hate to watch. They, they're such a bad fundamental team. It's just... They're tough to watch. And their bullpen was horrendous. They tried to bolster it, but I don't think it's enough. So is that, that your prediction? I for they, the Okay. The Mets are favorite in Vegas. They love them in Vegas. They made there them the, the favorite. I mean, my goodness. So um, we'll see. The players got to perform. I think the, everybody, the Mets have put this uh, personnel together. Now, okay, here it is. And go out and play and play up to your potential and it'll be, and, a, it'll be a fun year. And to your point, Keith, it, it has, it, 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 we haven't seen it. It hasn't congealed yet. There's a lot of new guys. And I, every time I say something positive about the Mets this year, I always do get this little devil on my shoulder saying, what about their defense? And I am really worried about like, there is real reason for concern. Obviously they, you added an all world defensive shortstop and you upgraded catching, uh, but some, their ability to catch the ball could, could really get in their way. And I, I do think that needs to be said. I think 162 game schedule, and this is not Dom Smith's fault. He's a first baseman and a very good one. And I commend him for going out in left field and then going out to a, to a strange position and not let it affect his hitting a young player. Mm -hmm. That's not easy. That's, that's not a, an, an easy uh, chore, but I think over a course of 162 with him out in left field, He'll catch whatever he can get to, but he doesn't cover a lot of ground. He's going to have to play deep because it's easier to go in on a ball than back. 
So that means that Lindor and J.D. Smith, uh, J.D. Davis, excuse me, that was the old 49er running back when I was a kid, J.D. Smith. Anyway, uh, see, I'm not being contemporary. Uh, well, it's somewhere back there in your brain. It just, it's well, I'll, I'll yeah. clip that one. I'll clip that one off for Kurt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, Lindor and Davis are going to have to, on short fly balls, never take it for granted. They're going to have to bust, uh-huh. bust out there and short left. You, um, you, Keith, you believe in Dom, uh, 60 game Dom? Is that the hitter that he is? Yeah, I just hope he can stay healthy. Um, he's a really good breaking ball hitter. And I remember That's Dom came to me, he was so frustrated when he was struggling in. Uh, the old hitting coach with the, with the dead Yankee dead pole. And Dom was just like, and I'd been there before I had Harry, the hat Walker trying to get me this, do the opposite, hit the, all the opposite field. And those were habits that stayed with me my whole career that I had to fight to make sure I didn't. And uh, I just told Dom, I said, just go up. What got you here? Go up and hit. But you know what? When you're a 21, 22 year old kid, what are you going to tell the coach to go shove yeah. it? You know, and also get one bad label on your back. One coach doesn't like you, and uh, you know you've got a you've got a bad label, and you may be in the minor leagues forever. And I just think that I commend Dom for p- uh, p- pushing through this because I've been there where you struggle and you doubt, and for him to pull through shows a lot of mental strength. So that's why I feel he's the real deal. He's got a nice swing, and he's a good breaking ball hitter. And this is baseball's now a breaking ball league. Yeah. He's such a good hitter and his spring training home runs, these moon shots that he's been hitting off a lot of breaking balls too. They look like fly ball outs and they just carry and carry and carry. Now the wind in Florida blows, yeah, but. Pitchers never learn. You even give them analytics. You give them all day to study hitters on a computer and they still make the same old stupid mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And you, you and people like you are beneficiaries. <laughs> the hitters are the beneficiaries of that. Um, all right, guys. Well, this has been really good. It, it makes me uh, very excited for the season to start. And um, again, we've talked about this roster a lot, top to bottom, and now we get to see how it all comes together and see if it works. Um, so Keith, uh, enjoy it. Enjoy being in the booth. Uh, I know that the game's not on our air on Thursday, but we'll see you on Saturday. And Andy, I'm sure we'll be talking on Baseball Night in New York as well as the week progresses and we get closer to opening day. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. Please oh, go ahead, Andy. You tell Kurt, I want the Paul O'Neill deal. Games from his basement. Don't you forget. Oh, okay, right, right. Or, or send me a limo. <laughs> Either. They do that we'll for talk- me. You don't get that? <laughs> we'll talk to you next week, everybody. Thanks for listening.